Welcome to Diversity, Non-Discrimination, Cultural Competency, Anti-Oppression, and Social Justice, Making Connections with Advocacy and the Experiences of Survivors. I am Michelle Dixon-Wall, the Resource Sharing Project Coordinator at the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs. This webinar has been adapted from a small piece of WICSAP's Advocate Core Training Curriculum. It can be used in lieu of the in-person lecture by state core trainers at community sexual assault programs. There is a lot of jargon in this kind of work. This webinar attempts to break down those terms and to help identify where you or your agency might be at in terms of your work and what you, and what you think might be your next step. For the purposes of this webinar, we will be using a disability framework to help us explore the connections to advocacy and the experiences of survivors. The terms in these ascending steps are what we are going to build on in this webinar, spending a bit more time in the end on anti-oppression and social justice. Diversity, non-discrimination, cultural competency, anti-oppression, and social justice are not synonyms. They are not words that replace one another, nor are they words that connote the same meaning or the same type of interaction. As advocates, it is vital that we take into account power relations and oppression. Advocating on behalf of survivors and being an ally includes thinking about services, survivors, and yourself in terms of diversity, cultural competency, anti-oppression, and social justice. Advocacy is about meeting people where they are at. This means, regardless of how long ago the sexual assault took place, the dynamics involved, or where they're at in their healing process, we connect with them as advocates. But also, advocacy is allyship. The way a survivor's identity and or group affiliation impact the dynamics of their sexual assault, their healing process, their experiences with systems and services may be significant, and at this, we want to connect with them as aspiring allies. Advocacy is a process in which we walk beside survivors and approach their challenges in collaboration with them. We want to work on what is important, the significant, the, what is important and significant to that particular survivor. Each survivor is at a different intersection of identity, healing, and experience. We can be most effective as advocates when we consider and are open to the significance of identity, discrimination, and oppression in the lives of all those survivors we work with. For us to start to define diversity for our purposes today, it helps to think about the many ways in which people in your agency or particular program are diverse. They might be diverse in terms of sexual orientation, religion, preferred language spoken, race, ability, gender, communication styles, age, immigration status, relationship status, the amount of children they have, Etc. The ways in which people are diverse in terms of their identities and experiences are endless. It also helps for us to consider that beliefs about sexual violence are diverse among those diverse people you know and the diverse people you work with. If we consider the diverse group in your agency or program, presumably people want to end sexual violence. This belief is what makes the group similar. It is important to recognize diversity is based on both attributes and beliefs. Working from a place of shared beliefs enable us to work with diversity more effectively. This is a good way to interact in the world, so why don't we stop here? Diversity helps me to understand that as an, an individual, you are similar to as well as different from me but it does not necessarily require me to do anything with that information. Simply employing a diversity approach is limiting. It is a basic level of understanding that does not necessitate connection.
for example, if I am an able-bodied person and I am advocating for a survivor of sexual assault with disabilities, I would certainly recognize the differences in the abilities. I would also recognize our similar beliefs that survivors deserve healing and justice. But beyond recognizing this diversity, I may not necessarily do anything different in the way that I advocate for this person. William M. Chase said, diversity is not casual, liberal tolerance of anything not yourself. It is not polite accommodation. Diversity is in action the painful awareness that other people, other races, other voices, other habits of mind have as much integrity of being as you do. Step two is non-discrimination. There are local, state, and federal non-discrimination laws that all programs should know about. At the very least, survivors accessing services must not be unlawfully discriminated against. Here are some important ones to note. The Office of Crime Victims Advocacy defines non-discrimination as the ability to provide services that are available and delivered without discrimination by reason of race, color, religion, disability, pregnancy, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, age, ethnicity, income, veteran status, marital status, or any other basis prohibited by federal, state, or local law. This is specific to Washington. The Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013, which President Obama signed on March 7, 2013, amends the Violence Against Women Act of 1994 by adding a grant condition that prohibits discrimination by recipients of certain Department of Justice funds. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, sex, gender identity, as defined uh, in paragraph 249, section 4 of Title 18 in the United States Code, sexual orientation or disability be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity funded in whole or in part with funds made available under the Violence Against Women Act and any other programs or activity funded in whole or in part with funds appropriated for grants, cooperative agreements, and other assistance administered by the Office on Violence Against Women. Non-discrimination provisions do change over time and more protected classes can and will be added. It is important to be up to date um, with non-discrimination laws and grant conditions. So let's break this down using a scenario. If an organization does not have an elevator or ramp to their office and declines services to a survivor in a wheelchair because they cannot accommodate them, then they are violating the Americans with Disabilities Act, OCVA core standards, and the Violence Against Women Act. All organizations receiving federal funding, which includes most sexual and domestic violence organizations, must comply with the ADA. The organization can and should make other accommodations if they do not have a ramp for this particular survivor by arranging another location to meet that provides for confidential and comfortable advocacy services. This requires an advocacy agency to do something. And yet the survivor is now being treated differently or at least cannot access drop-in services because location arrangements must be pre-made. Because we want survivors with disabilities to access our services and feel safe and respected, we want to continue on to cultural competency. Cultural competency takes our connections a step further. Cultural competency is defined as the ability to recognize and respect diverse cultural factors and the effects of these factors on various communities' need for and access to services. 
Cultural factors include race, education, ethnicity, language, nationality, religion, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, socioeconomic class, ability, age, geographic influence, political affiliation, and immigration status, uh, according to the Office of Crime Victims Advocacy, Accreditation Core Service Standard, AC1. Consider how many cultures are in the state of Washington. There are as many cultures as there are people in Washington state, and that's more than 7 million people. I want to add a note about using census data and thinking about cultural competency for your agency. Census data can be problematic if it is the only source of information you are using to get a handle on your population in terms of cultural competency and outreach strategies. For example, census data only reflects self-reported information from those that are asked, and the options can be limiting in terms of identity. Identities are categorized and chosen by outside entities, including options that say some other or two or more races. As you can see from these sections taken from the 2010 census form, it's fairly limiting in race, gender, or rather um, sex, and sexual orientation. So you would want to be sure that this is not what you are relying on as your sort of guidepost when looking into your services or the diversity of your staff or board in reflecting your community. I would also add that if 98% of the community is white, that means that the other 2% are likely even more vulnerable, isolated, and could use even more targeted care, concern, and representation. The marginalized peoples of communities are more likely, of course, to experience domestic violence and sexual assault. Cultural competency is not a finite process. Therefore, this step necessitates a commitment to lifelong learning. And because there are so many cultures, in addition to learning about others, it is perhaps more important to learn about your own beliefs, attitudes, and biases in order to work effectively with diverse cultural factors. Learning about other people and cultures needs to be primarily self-educated and self-directed. We cannot expect people whom you want to learn about to do the educating for you. Nobody represents their entire culture or community. This does not mean you cannot ask survivors how their culture has affected their experience um, of sexual assault, and in fact you should, and how their culture has been affected by a sexual assault. It moves beyond an individual recognition of diversity to a cultural perspective and requires us to do something with this knowledge. Most of what needs to be done is collaborative with other organizations that have expertise about and provide services for various communities and cultures. As sexual assault advocates, we cannot be everything to everybody. We must reach out and build partnerships with other service providers in order to support survivors as holistically as possible. For example, as an advocate for a survivor with disabilities, um, a survivor of sexual assault with disabilities, I've already done the first step of recognizing and respecting the differences. One facet of becoming culturally competent requires that I do something to make sure my services are meaningfully accessible and relevant. For example, you can ask yourself these questions about your agency. Do advocates know how to work the TTY machine? Do advocates know to sit or kneel next to somebody in a wheelchair as opposed to standing over them? Are the organization services helpful in ways as defined by the disability community? Think about what ways you commit as individuals and as organizations to becoming culturally competent. In this anti-oppression section, we are looking at how the abuse of power disparities result in internalized superiority and internalized inferiority. 
analyzing oppression causes us to look at personal experiences in the social, political, and economic context in which they occur. We are going beyond the good points of diversity, non-discrimination, and cultural competency to an analysis of power relations. This causes and the causes and the connections in power disparities. It helps to look at a few definitions as we're moving forward into anti-oppression and social justice. The differences in power, some examples are illustrated here to, um, uh, some of the examples are illustrated here, have led to a lot of violence and distrust between and within groups, and the groups with less societal power have suffered especially hard, both historically and currently. Current oppression of groups with less access to power are often echoes of the past these folks have been oppressed. Oppression is the domination of one group or groups of people for the benefit of another, whether it's wanted or unwanted. There are three characteristics of oppression, and um, oppression is different from prejudice or discrimination. Oppression affects whole groups of people, not just individuals. Oppression is a system upheld by institutions, media, government, education, healthcare, religion, etc., laws, policies, um, e economic systems, and societal beliefs and norms. Prejudice is different um, because it's a positive or negative attitude toward a person or a group without just grounds or sufficient knowledge. President, pre prejudice is an attitude. Discrimination is unequal treatment of people based on their membership in, in a group, as we discussed um, prior in non-discrimination. In contrast to prejudice, discrimination is a behavior. Oppression manifests in a lot of different ways, hate, exploitation, violence, fear, pain, etc., all of which help to maintain this power divide. One of the first steps to fighting oppression is being able to name and understand how it impacts us. Oppression is larger than individual attitudes. It is a whole system at play. Survivors experience multiple forms of oppression every day, and it, impa it impacts how they access and interact with survivors and with services and systems. There are many paths to go down with anti-oppression, and we'll explore a few of these avenues. Look at the ways that access, both to power and the way systems are structured, has set up barriers, or not, to services and safety. We know that sexual assault affects women with disabilities at disproportionately high rates. So why aren't more women with disabilities accessing services? Among adults who are developmentally disabled, as many as 83% of females and 32% of males are victims of sexual assault. 40% of women with physical disabilities reported being sexually assaulted. 49% of people with developmental disabilities who are victims of sexual violence will experience 10 or more abusive incidents. So if we look at the causes, um, why aren't more women accessing, um, more women with disabilities accessing those services? There are a few items um, like transportation limitations, dependency on potentially abusive caregivers, and then the perceived and actual service provider and sensitivity. Look at the ways that oppression in dominant culture is used by perpetrators to bolster sexual assault. Beliefs and behaviors in our society send messages that people with disabilities are not or cannot be sexual people. 
this is an, an oppressive stereotype that may be used against the survivor by someone they are dating to convince them that they won't be believed. Another anti-oppression avenue is to look at the ways we are personally impacted by oppression. As targets, we may experience oppression based on perceived memberships in certain groups like disability, gender, ethnicity, class, sexual orientation, etc. As agents, our perceived group memberships are ascribed power, privilege, and access over other groups, again, whether wanted or unwanted. For example, as an able-bodied person, systems and places are designed with me in mind. I can expect me as an agent, I can expect to move about freely and easily. My ease of movement and access comes at the expense of people with physical disabilities, everything from living independently to being able to open a door. These privileges can be expected whether wanted or unwanted simply because I'm able-bodied. As an agent, benefiting from whatever type of ascribed power, privilege, and or access, I can work to, un to end the unearned privileges I do not deserve, which come at the expense of others, and work to spread the privileges that should belong to everybody. This is, in essence, allyship. And being an ally is an active word and not an identity. I have heard people describe allyship as something that expires every day at midnight and has to be renewed the next day. Just like cultural competency, allyship and anti-oppression work are not finite, but a lifelong process and commitment of trying and making mistakes and learning and trying again. When these categories of target and agent are broken down and the social construction is exposed, these group memberships seem kind of absurd. However, the impacts of oppression are very real in the lives of survivors and manifest in the forms of violence, barriers to help, and um, taken together, the barriers and the, the forms of violence, taken together can be experienced um, as described by author Marilyn Fry. She says, this experience of oppression is like living one's life confined and shaped by forces and barriers which are not accidental or occasional and hence avoidable, but are systematically related to each other in such a way as to catch one between and among them and restrict or penalize motion in any direction. As we begin to define and unpack what social justice means in the context of our work, it helps to look at a few ways others have defined it. It is a complex thing to describe because it is not tangible, and a great way to avoid jargon is to look out at how some other activists have described it. Indigenous Australian activist Leela Watson says, if you, had, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Eduardo Galliano has said, um, I don't believe in charity. I believe in solidarity. Charity is so vertical, it goes from the top to the bottom. Solidarity is horizontal. It respects the other person, and I have a lot to learn from other people. Here uh, at Sexual Assault Agencies, our prevention work is our social justice work. Primary prevention requires us to get to the root causes of violence and oppression. We have to shift the use of acceptance of violence as a means of power and control. In Washington State, our primary prevention approach is deeply connected to social justice work. 
we have prioritized community-led prevention strategies. And an anti-oppression framework is one of the key components of how we vision comprehension, comprehensive uh, primary prevention. When we look at sexual violence against women with disabilities, we see the intersection of sexism and ableism. This requires our primary prevention work to not only be not only address root causes of sexual violence, but also the dynamics that devalue the bodies and sexuality of people with disabilities. In this example, the intersections of sexual violence and ableism can be seen in a large focus of curricula for those with disabilities teaching healthy sexuality. This approach is widely used in prevention and is especially relevant for this population as the view of folks with disabilities as not being sexual is an important root cause to address. In addition to individual level efforts to promote healthy sexuality, we must also incorporate this into the work of in communities to change norms that perpetuate these intersecting forms of oppression. Community and societal norms change requires us to value and recognize people with disabilities as having the same rights around their sexuality as everyone else. This population should and can have autonomy over their bodies, including their sexuality. The difference between social service and social justice is that social service works to alleviate hardship, while social while social justice aims to eradicate the root causes of that hardship. Achieving social justice means that fighting ableism, homophobia, transphobia, racism, xenophobia, classism, ageism, sexism, etc., are a part of our work as advocates, preventionists, and as an agency. It is important for us to have a vision for social justice, a positive vision for what we want the world to look like, and that we are balancing direct services to survivors with engaging survivors in our work and working against harmful systems of oppression that allow sexual violence to thrive. Survivors experience multiple forms of oppression every day, and it impacts how they access and interact with services and systems. We know that another world is possible and necessary for our collective survival. Systems of oppression are not going to change themselves. We have to take action to transform society to liberate ourselves and our communities. This concludes the webinar. This section is on additional reading and resources. Um, including anti-racism process and practice, a WICSAP publication about um, our agency process around our anti-racism work, um, an additional webinar um, done by um, the Portland Women's Crisis Line on creating an anti-racist organization um, that can be found on our website. Intersections of Oppression and Sexual Violence. This is a paper um, written by the Sexual Assault Task Force of Oregon in um, collaboration with the um, Oregon Coalition. Additionally, focusing on social justice and prevention, um, Cal CASA Prevent Connect has a podcast series on social justice as a foundation to prevention work. Um, we also have included here designing a comprehensive primary prevention strategy, which is a prevention tip from WICSAP um, that includes a list of qualities for work to be considered comprehensive primary prevention in Washington State, um, including, uh, as mentioned prior, um, the inclusion of anti-oppression framework in that. 
as well as the um, uh, tip on sexuality education for youth and adults with cognitive or developmental disabilities. That includes a bunch of um, resources and curricula for doing primary prevention um, more targeted at the disability community. Thank you for joining us, and I hope that you um, are able to reach out for WixApp for any technical assistance that you might need regarding any of this um, information today, and that you can share this recorded webinar with volunteers, staff, or you that is in service at your agency. Thank you.